So uh, with that, uh, we're going to we're going to begin with what we do online and welcome folks in from literally around around the world. I was trading emails with a, a, another gentleman speaker that you guys probably, if you've been here before, uh, you remember Pastor uh, Alan uh, Evangelist Alan Green, who sends greetings because he's actually in Thailand ministering even as we speak. So AEA is truly a global ministry. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, Pastor Alan, <laughs> uh, wherever you are. You know, we minister from every place from the San Blas Islands of Panama. Uh, there's uh, underground stuff happening in uh, a lot of different countries that we can't really, shouldn't even be talking about. Uh, so we won't, we'll, we'll, but, but this is actually today is a celebration of um, the great news of the gospel. Since 1954, uh, the American Evangelistic Association has been true to its calling. It, it was uh, envisioned by Dr. John Douglas as the whole gospel to the whole world. And so now 69 years later, going into our 70th, 70th year of service, we are now at the place that... Um, I think the gospel is ready to be preached even stronger and more fervently than ever. How many know you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Even the world knows there's problems out there, right? You know, and, and so uh, how many in here know we have the answer? And his name is J-E-S-U-S. And so we're here to hold up the, na the name of Jesus. So uh, I'm Kerry Fink. I have the honor of working with some of the greatest ministries in the world through the AEA uh, ministry. We are so grateful to Bishop Jerry Lawrence and uh, his wife, Pastor Maria. And uh, they have so kind to always open the doors of Community Gospel Truth Church here in Melbourne to allow us to have our fall conference right here. Uh, and this, again, is uh, such an exciting opportunity for us. I was going back through notes, and, you know, it's funny because uh, if, you, if you pray and you walk with God, he gives you, how many know he gives you secret information? He tells you things about what to do. He protects you from things that you need to avoid. So I don't ever want to be off the path of, of, of what God has to say. And so as we were all talking and praying about what the theme for this year is, God spoke two words, let's go. And so then I started going back and saying, well, what was our theme last year? Because I didn't even remember. Do you, do you guys remember? No, that's okay because because this is this this was my experience. 2022, one year ago today, it was preparing for God's plan. Think about that for a minute. So a year ago, the the word of the Lord was preparing for God's plan. This year, I believe what we're going to hear from our wonderful speakers who are going to present workshops today is we're going to be charged and equipped for let's go. I want to talk for just a moment about the unusual level of attack that a lot of people have been going through leading up to this conference. How many have seen like just crazy stuff happen, little obstructions, little distractions, little, some are not so little, some are pretty serious looking, and how many know that those are deceptions of the enemy? And so I wanna say, first of all, you made it here. You are here, you are in the building, despite what the enemy tried. And that means God has a plan for your life he is not, his plan is not to be thwarted by any foolishness of the enemy or any kind of stuff like that, because God said, and it is, it's just is, you know, God said, let there be, he just had to say it one time and it still is. He didn't have to repeat it. He didn't have to say, let me get your attention. He just spoke it and it is. So I just want to say, I want to say that, that you made it here. And you are going to come in one way, but you're going to go out a whole different way. Because when you hear what God is about to do, you're going to hear some amazing, amazing workshop speakers who uh, spend a lot of time with the Lord seeking his guidance. So what you're going to hear, we, there's something that we always talk about in some of the podcasts and things we do. You say, if you're hearing my voice or you're hearing uh, my friend Glenn Reppel's voice, then you're hearing the wrong thing. If, if, we're, if we are correct, you're hearing the word of God through the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're always anxious to do. Get us out of the way. Let's do what God wants to do here. So I wanna kind of welcome you. We've got a great day uh, in store for you. Uh, I'm really excited. We have a number of different workshops that we're gonna be covering today. Uh, the first one, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll introduce, Glenn Reppel is gonna present on uh, fraud, what God has to say about the tactics of the enemy. Because how many know there's nothing new under the sun? 
right? It, the sin is, you know, we, we always are like shocked. We turn on the TV and we hear something, you know, and we're like, what kind of debauchery is this? <laughs> you know, or what, what, how can people do this? It's not new. It's the, it's the same, it's the same stuff that always has happened. And so the enemy's trick because he's just, he's just a counterfeiter, right? The best he can do is come up and try to fake people into stuff. He's like a con artist. He's like a, you know, a fraud. And, and so, so we're going to start today there, but that's not where we're going to wind up. We're going to keep going because I love, I, I, I call Dr. Loretta Anicelli with um, Equip Care Ministries. She's also the director of admissions for Chesapeake Bible College. She's been part of AEA for years. And I said, what does the Lord put on your heart to share? And she goes, the time. I'm sorry. Yeah, she said the time is now. And I thought she came up with that independently before I said the word I keep hearing is let's go. Which, me, which to me is like, you know, you, you, if you get a word from the Lord, you're always trying to get a confirmation. Like, am I just being crazy or did I, did I actually get this right? And so I love it when that. And then so we uh, called a great friend of our ministry. He, he was planning to be here, uh, but his best friend had a um, heart attack yesterday morning. You want to talk about interference of the enemy. Uh, so he is in El Paso, Texas. But he is still making the time. His friend is going in for quadruple bypass surgery. And I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus, that is going to be successful. Everything that is uh, not of the Lord has to get out today. This is, this is God's house. We, are, we have no other place to turn than the Lord. But he tells us, by his stripes, we are healed. I, lo I, love, the, I love to say this. You know, why do they call it practicing medicine? Why is it called practicing medicine? Because you're doing the best that you can do as a man. So I believe that God works through doctors. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying the healing comes from the Lord, right? Okay, so we're believing for healing for Dr. Greg Retrain, but he said this is important and I wanna be here today. So he's going to, uh, God willing with our technology, be here via Zoom and he goes, let's go, it's time for the gospel then uh, we're gonna have some really exciting ministry updates where we're gonna talk with uh, Loretta Dozier. Wave your hand, Loretta. She is the founder of Dove Bible Club. This is one of the coolest ministries ever because how many know that even the schools are challenged to figure out what to do with kids? Do you think it could have to do with taking prayer out of school? Do you think, do you think, you know? So, so we're gonna talk about how Dr. Loretta is bringing prayer back into the school. So this is so important. And then we're going to have, we're going to have a word from uh, Pastor Jim Begley. Wave your hand, Pastor Jim. So Jim and his wife, Pastor Susan, they run Wholeness to Freedom. And it's so exciting what's been happening on their campus over there that they're getting ready to, they're focused on restoring people. How many know the gospel is about restoring people? That's why we call it you're born again, right? Because you get, you get a fresh start. And so we're going to be talking about all that's happening there. Then this afternoon, Dr. Ed Knetzer, wave Dr. Ed. <laughs> Dr. Ed is the president of the Chesapeake Bible College and Seminary, which began in 1977 under the auspices of Dr. William and Shirley Comfort. And uh, what did we figure when we were trying to do math? It was how 46 years of service. So what I love about it is it's a tried and true and proven um, method for higher education. We're going to talk about some of the things that are unique about that later this afternoon. But I asked Dr. I asked Dr. Ed, what do you want to, what do you want to uh, talk about? And he said, the heart of moving forward. So you see how all these things, everybody kind of independently seeking the Lord's wisdom says, this is what I need to talk about. And then also Dr. KC Gilchrist, wave Dr. KC all the way, originally from India, but now from Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, which is kind of like suburban Toronto to give you a somewhat, somewhat of an idea. But I asked him, I said, what do you want to speak about? And he said, let's go in Jesus name. Why, where, when, and how? So we have got a terrific day ahead of us and I'm just grateful for you. I'm going to ask um, the, the uh, overseer of the house here, Bishop Jerry Lawrence and Pastor Maria to come up and do opening prayer and worship. But how many know we can't do enough prayer? So I'm actually going to do a pre-prayer before we do our prayer. Is that okay? <laughs> so so let's let's go let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. It's a beautiful day here in Florida. We are so grateful. We take not a single moment of it for granted. We appreciate that our next breath comes because you said so. And we just thank you for the opportunity to stand here 
on the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to share the Word of God in a way that's inspirational and will help us in the things that you have called us to do, Lord. We are your servants. We don't want to do anything of our own accord. We can't do anything of our own accord. Our only help is what, what you tell us to do. So please, Lord, get us out of the way. Let this be all about you and saving saving the souls that you love and care for through your son, Jesus Christ. You already paid the sacrifice. It's done. It's done. Let us help people walk in the victory that you already put out in front of us for all those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Help us find those folks. Help us get the word to spread the gospel. You said you said to get it out to every every creature on earth. Help us preach that gospel through. Thank you for making the technology possible so those people can tune in from all over the world, wherever they are. Thank you for giving us this wonderful facility and a great breakfast uh, right here at the Community Gospel Truth Church here in Melbourne, Florida. Thank you for everyone who's in the house with us today. We just ask and thank you right now for canceling any assignment of the enemy uh, and any foolishness that uh, he would try to bring. This place is covered by the blood, and there is nothing more efficacious than that. We thank you for all the pastors of AEA. We want to we want to thank you for Bishop Charles and, and Dr. Judy Farmer and the entire team up in Washington, D.C. who are on the front lines of this. We want to thank all of those who have gone before us, our, uh, uh, our, our wonderful Dr. Marge Douglas and, and her husband, uh, Dr. John Douglas, who— uh, who, who served this organization. Want to give thanks for Dr. John Reinhold, who served this organization for so many years. Uh, we've been here now close to 70 years, and, and we just pray that we're able to bring glory uh, to your name, Lord, through the works that we attempt to do uh, with, your, with your guidance, your help, your leading. But, Lord, we just thank you for everyone's health in here. We believe this is a day of healing, that whatever ailments were, we, we may have started the day with, any, any pains, any frustrations, any... Uh, challenges, Lord, that we, we just know that you're removing them right now, even as we speak. We want to enter your, your gates with, uh, with thanksgiving and, and your courts with praise. We just can't give you thanks enough, God, for who you are and what you're about to do in this place. We thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Bishop Jerry. Amen. Shalom, y'all. So, I guess the only thing left for me to say is, Lord, I agree with him. Amen. That, that, that's it. <laughs> Whatever he said, Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, let's, let, let's just bow our heads. Father, we ask you to glorify yourself in the midst of us today. We ask, Father God, that you send waves of refreshing to your ministers. That, Father God, that we will be re-energized as we worship and as we praise you and as we sit under the teaching and the instruction of the, your word. Father, we pray that everything that is done and said in this house, Lord God, and from on the outside coming in, Father, it will be a blessing. It will be directly from your heart and from your throne. And Father God, may we all receive it with gladness and joy. And may we run in the power of your anointing, following your lead, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I am so I am so excited about having my good friend Glenn Reppel uh, come and present workshop number one. Uh, I'm trying to remember. It's been so many years, Glenn, since we met, and we've been on a lot of um, Jesus adventures together. Uh, we do a podcast. Uh, Glenn has done a thing called the Repl Minute. So first of all, let me back up a step. So Glenn runs one of uh, the largest um, financial services companies called GA Repl and Company. So his background, he's a, he's a, he's a financial guy. He started out uh, in a major brokerage firm early on in his career, decided that he was called to build his own company, GA Repl and Company. They're located in uh, Orlando, greater Orlando area. And Glenn is all about, he, he, we talk about this a lot. He calls it a for-profit ministry. I know that sounds maybe a little odd, but, but do you understand what I'm saying? So the reason that we conduct business is because we're trying to expand the gospel. But there's, you know, I don't know where it came up that poverty is holy. I, you know, it, it, there's a difference between money having you and you having money. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Do you understand what I'm talking about? The question is, what are we going to do with the money? Are we going to expand the kingdom? Are we going to do those things? So uh, in 2006, the Lord gave um, Glenn Reppel uh, a mission because he, he, he literally has offices like in every state, just about every state. I mean, there's no lawyers present, so I can, I can take a little bit of Holy Ghost license. I, I think sometimes like you look on the website, it says in 48 states, whatever. 
but basically has offices and works with financial uh, counselors in, in almost every state. And one of the things that he's big about doing is making sure that assets benefit the, the, the kingdom. And I, I, I will butcher this terribly, but one of the things that um, he does is he works with people who have, uh, who have assets and they're trying to figure out like financial planning. And so the thing is, well, I want this to benefit my kids when, when I'm, when, you know, when I go on to my great reward, et cetera. And one of the things that Glenn has figured out is there's a way to use the way the tax laws are set up that you don't have to just give it to your kids. And, and without trying to do any of that, let's just say that he's come up with totally correct pathways that use the tax code correctly. Remember, I remember in, uh, in business school, I had a tax attorney for a professor and he said, the law system here in the United States is that you were supposed to pay the legal minimum tax that's due period. So that's your responsibility as a citizen, pay the minimum tax that you are responsible for. So what Glenn has done is he's worked with his advisors and team of people that he works with. They've come up with a program that allows you, instead of just passing assets, he's what if you could take those assets, pass them to your kids, but also make it work for the kingdom. Pretty provocative if you think about it. So he does a whole thing on that. But in 2006, the Lord gave him, the Lord gave him a message to go out and preach a word of encouragement. Maybe it started because you were just trying to encourage the people in your company, but since then it's grown to everybody can access it. It's called the REPL Minute. It's a daily Monday through Friday, kind of a moment of biblical inspiration. And then as, as I got to know and work with Glenn, Glenn said, I, the Lord's put it on my heart. I've got to put, put together a book. I said, what is it? He said, it's called fraud. I said, well, that's pretty, pretty unusual for a financial guy <laughs> to write a book on fraud. He said, no, no, I want to talk about the original fraud. And I don't want to give the whole story away. But from fraud, the book, um, he's been out, he's been talking a lot uh, in, in different places about it. And it's actually grown into a thing called the Kingdom Living Podcast, which we now um, distribute using social media. It reaches somewhere in the vicinity of 2 million people every 90 days, literally globally. So we're talking to people that we never get a chance to maybe meet on this side, but preaching the gospel. And one of the things that we get the feedback from people in all parts of the world, they're excited about the fact that not only is it gospel, tr gospel truth, but it's also showing them or reorienting them that through marketplace ministry, you can make a difference. And so, um, what I don't want to do is take up Glenn's time. I want to get out of the way, let Glenn have an opportunity to share with you because this thing, this message fraud is going to help you understand something. Glenn has been at a lot of speaking engagements recently. And it was, it's interesting because the book was written, I think 2017, 2018. But what he's been told lately is that this is a book about identity and how many know, like you turn on the TV and you think you're, I'm watching a science fiction movie, right? You know, how, how can young kids be so confused about identity? Just, just as one example. But most of us, if we don't have the Lord as our rock, we, we could be, we're very much confused about who we are, what our purpose here and what we're trying to do. And so with that, let me hand the microphone over to Glenn and let's learn about fraud, what God has to say about the tax economy. Glenn Reppel. Thank you, Gary. Can, can you hear me? You okay? Good. Good. You could have kept on going. You could have done the whole thing. <laughs> you're amazing, Carrie. What you've done, the influence, and and just what what you're doing here in the community and around the, around the world. It's just brothers and sisters. What an honor it is to be here, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we're here to let's go. Yeah, go ahead and distribute the books, and and also because uh, one one things I want to do is we're brothers and sisters. So I want to share with you. Uh, the scriptures, because one of the things we do on the podcast together is I'm reading scriptures. And, and, and again, uh, because the word of God is alive and active, and it's sharper than a double-edged sword, and that double-edged sword is his word speaking through our mouth. It's a double-edged mouth. And so each one of us here are, is that voice listening to the Holy Spirit, and we're speaking the word of truth. And we speak that truth, it impacts hearts and lives. So the question would be, what's the most powerful thing that we have? The Holy Spirit speaking through our mouth. Yeah, so that mouth gives us the Spirit. And again, what I heard up here was, 
we were speaking truth through our singing and our praising and our worship. And that's coming out of our mouth. So as it comes out of our mouth, what does it do to our soul? You know, because it, it just builds it up. That living water just comes out of us. And what does that do to our body? Because I heard the body being mentioned. What does it do? It heals. This body was never designed to die. We just did a podcast on the 6,000 year lie. Because, oh gosh, I'm getting off track here because I want to go through these slides. Um, but but the, the big fraud of amongst the 40 frauds that, that are in the book uh, is that these are all frauds. And one of them was when you eat from this tree, what happens? You'll die. So that entered death. And we've been believing death more than life. We speak death more than life also. So, um, and, I, and I, I have these slides because I want you, if you want to use these, they're yours, because there's a couple of slides in there that I think that, that are useful because uh, you all are out there speaking the word of God. Uh, and so the big fraud, I'm going to skip on over to really like the thorn. Who are you? Um, and, and again, as, as I do that, because that's the big question, I think, to the youth and around to, to the adults. Who, who are you? But here's another question. What defines you? What defines you? And so I'm speaking, I, I'm going to be speaking in a couple of weeks to a group of major CEOs. And, and in my presentation, uh, they, went, they had title on there. And I, and I put son. Son. I'm a son. And what does it say back here? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of what? The sons of God. Everything creation is waiting for us to know our identity of who we are. Not that we have to die to go to heaven, but heaven came to earth to live inside of this tabernacle, this body now. It's a now. This body this body is looking for life through the Holy Spirit, revealing who we are, washing us clean, and this body lives. It's designed for life. And we've been trained that it's designed for death. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing. Uh, because there's not many places that will speak this truth out here uh, that be the church. We are the church. We're the tabernacle. We're the living tabernacle now. Okay, let's flip on over to... You know, some, um, okay, yeah, let's flip on over to the kingdom of heaven, uh, that, that slide. Let's, let's go a couple of more slides. There we are, there we are. Uh, so in, in this, this, and I'm not sure how much I'm going to get into this because I really want to get to some things with, but you took away so much of my time anyway, Carrie. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but one of the things that's really important and one of the questions that, that, we, that I like to ask, what are the three, and this is in the book, this book uh, is designed as 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 Kerry mentioned uh, as 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 a discipleship book because what's happening is we're asking people to come to the altar say the say the uh, say the prayer of salvation but we've got to disciple people and what we're seeing is this book is a discipleship book and I I had no idea that when I wrote it but that was on identity and so what's happened some of uh, the rehab some of uh, some of the crisis pregnancy centers some of the schools because that's that's what the enemy's lie has been is uh, to identify with the world system rather than the kingdom of God and that's prevalent in the church is we're and we're going to see some scriptures on that so the the three greatest historical event and again that's quite a big graphic there uh, and and I'd love to just because we've got a couple of podcasts that just go through through this graphic here but we have is the creation the th the three greatest historical events is it, and again uh, God even knew us before creation we need to understand that and then creation came and then then and how'd that work out? God made us in His image and likeness. We have Adam and Eve, and 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 so we have these two trees there in the garden. We're going to be talk, talking about. We have many trees. We we have the tree of life, and that tree of life is abundance, not scarcity. It's abundance that we've got, and it and that tree is the tree of love, the tree of love, and and out of that comes the fruit of the spirit, and it's the I am tree. As He is, so are we in this world. Now, and by the way, that is so neat because Laura's going to be talking about now. We're, we're in a now. What is, what was, and what has come is a now gospel now. Not a wait to the future. It's a gospel now. And so, so with that, 
uh, we have creation, we have the fall, and, and, and with the fall uh, was when Adam and Eve made, made the decision to eat from the tree of death, of good and evil. And that tree is a tree of judgment, where we're judging others rather than seeing others the way God sees us, which is clean and holy before the foundation of the earth, is to see people the way we really are, the way they are, and we're judging. We're judging all the time. And that's a tree of judgment. Judgment already happened on the cross, which is the third greatest historical event is the redemption and recreation of all mankind now and heaven came to earth so jesus had to leave so that the holy spirit the triune god the godhead could come live in man he looked for that body that son to manifest the earth now and all creation all creation all mankind's crying out for the sons to manifest and this is the time, and I really believe that this is happening more now than ever. And by the way, this, this is such an example of an ecclesia here. This is an ecclesia. It is the church. We've associated the church as a building with a steeple. The church is us. We understand we're that walking tabernacle. We're that tree of life. And when we're singing up here, hopefully people see the body with the body, with the Holy Spirit, with the radiance of the joy that we sang about, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's so important. So let's flip on over to the next slide, um, which which is well, well, let me let me let me stay back. Let go back to that that last one we had there. Is it's a through, through redemption? Uh, have, because what happens? We've looked at God so many times as being up there. Okay, He's in us. He's in us, and it's so important that uh, praying to God. Well, God God saying, "Hey, I told you to go do it. Go go go." We need to go. So we're praying to God to go do something. He's told us because he's given us the dominion here of the earth. And, and so it's so important that we get that idea is, is that, and then that, down on the red line, so through the fall is the red line. And, and the fall was the, is the kingdom of darkness. Now look at this definition. Darkness represents mankind's ignorance of the redeemed identity and innocence. That's so powerful is that what we walk, when we walk, see, that's also a definition of sin. See, when, we, when we're speaking our, our, our fallen identity, that's sin. When he came, redeemed us, and made us whole and complete, when I'm speaking sickness or disease, when I'm sp speaking lack, uh, I'm speaking the kingdom of darkness rather than the kingdom of God who's living inside of me. So darkness represents mankind's ignorance of their redeemed identity. And, and brothers, this, our church is speaking that. It's speaking. They're speaking. They're not speaking life. They're speaking death over the... I mean, what do we hear on the news? We're hearing death, worry, fear. What was COVID? Fear. Fear. It's fear of what? Death. And death has been overcome by the blood of Jesus. The, the last enemy has been defeated on the cross. Praise God. Thank you that I can say that. There's liberty and freedom to be able to say that here. Because there's some believe it hasn't been defeated. It was defeated. Sickness and disease and death was taken on the cross. We have many that just believe in spiritual life and not the physical life now. Adam wasn't designed to die. He's never designed to die. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And again, some of, that's why I wanted to give these to you too. And, and again, I'm glad to give the PowerPoints to anybody that wants those because you all are teachers, you're disciplers uh, going out into the community. And so what we have here, so we've got to look at these two trees because so much of what we're, we're about on a day-to-day -day basis is the tree of life or tree of death. What are this, what's the thoughts that's in our head? What's, what are we speaking? What are we saying to our spouses, our children, our friends? What's the message when the phone call comes in, the email comes in, uh, that circumstance comes in? And so, and down, down at the bottom there's the scripture says, the thief uh, does, not, does not come except. So he's coming to do what? Steal, kill, and destroy. What's the definition of that? Death. Okay, that's the death. That's what's being spoken. And with that, it's covered in fear. So that's the word that's out there. That's the app. I walk in here. This atmosphere is covered with life. Life abundantly. Life abundantly is here. So, so th by the way, this is Jesus. So Jesus says, I come that you might have life. And, and that's life now. That's not life. They have to die to get life. That's life now. We already died. 
We are joy. We rose with Him. So that they have life and that we may have it abundantly. So let's look at the tree of life there. So the tree of life is a, because righteousness and life go together. So when, when the revelation of righteousness, of our identity is righteousness, when that comes in, life comes in. And we have that righteousness consciousness of who I am. I am. And so in the root of that tree of life is because God is love. And guess who we are? As he is, so we in this world. So, so we're a, we have love. We are love beings with that coming out. And then out of the, the water flows. Uh, uh, I have a friend, I, have a friend and, and, uh, I call him a water walker. Because uh, we, we, we not times we'll talk at three or four o'clock in the morning. And say, what are, what are you getting today? And uh, he says, Glenn, send me a picture of you. And so, so what I have is a picture on my cell phone of, of the Jesus with a river of living water. And he sent me uh, a, a picture of him, which is Jesus walking on water. So, so we are that mirror of Jesus. When we look in the mirror, we see Jesus. Not, not ourselves anymore. We, that's the transformation. So we're looking and seeing ourselves. Then all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're looking at a different mirror. And so it's really important, as, as Carrie said, if, if, and it's so important on the podcast that we do together, is that it's Scripture. And, and if you're hearing, because God's Word is spirit and truth, and it's speaking out there. And that's why what we're speaking is so important through the Word of God. So, so the, tree, the tree of life uh, is love, and, and, and that's, it's, it's, it's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then we have on the other side the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is really condemnation. And what's being spoken of, you know, we, we have political parties now, but we have a kingdom of God party where God is ruling through us for the manifestation of this earth as sons to rule. And, and what we're looking for is man to rule us where God has already said, hey, you go do and rule here on earth and take dominion. This is the kind of ecclesia that is sending in this kind of ministry that's sending us out to go do. Because that's what is in here. We're disciplers. We are disciplers. And so the message that's going on in the schools, many times in the church, uh, is a hell message versus, versus a kingdom of God message of life and abundance now. And so, uh, and, and again, so, so when we hear the words of anger and rude and envy and prideful and selfish and unforgiving and boastful, and like so, see, see that, that's, that's the death message uh, uh, that, that we hear out there so much. So and let's flip on over to the, to the, the next one that's similar in, is in the tree of life and the tree of death is, and this is such an important scripture in Romans 8, uh, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So this, this is so important that we, we recognize, and again, in this room we do that, but we're out there trying to teach because I know when I got the revelation that Christ in me is the hope of glory. I go, wait a minute, Christ in me is the hope of glory. And we're going to see a scripture here that really is just even defines that some more here. But, but the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that's a law and it's a spirit. So it's a spirit. So uh, God is spirit. So in, and we have the spirit of God in us through the Holy Spirit. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ has done what? Set, has set us free. So, and again, there's freedom in this ecclesia here. There is freedom. You walk in, there's freedom amongst. So as we walk in and as, as we're, we're uh, praising the Lord this morning, is, is the body re re reflects the joy of the Lord and the freedom that we have in Christ. With all the circumstances, with all the fear, with all the worry that's out there, we have the glory of God now reflecting who we are in our identity. And, that, and again, that's a, part, a major part of the purpose of the book is, is fraud, is, is we've, been, we've convinced our identity was stolen 6,000 years ago. And so we're fighting, and, and again, not fight, I mean, we, we've realized that, hey, uh, our identity is in Christ, is in Christ Jesus. So, so the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from, from the law of sin and death. Thank you. Has, has made me free, has set us free. So we're not under the condemnation uh, law anymore. And again, what do we see man doing? Just making more laws, more laws, more laws, and more laws, and to fall into that combination. Because, and, and we come from, I know I'm celebrating my 40th year of, of hearing the voice of God when I heard the voice says, I, God, uh, God loves me, and recognize that God loves me. So on that journey, on that journey, 
uh, many times what we do is we, we get into different bodies. Uh, and, and, and again, like most of us, we're getting rid of a lot of that religious thinking or that tradition and doctrine that nullifies the Word of God. And, and as that happens, and the revelation, and, and we were talking this before, and, uh, before we came in, was the whole idea that, uh, and, and Paul learned this. Paul says, I didn't learn this from any man. I learned it from the Holy Spirit. And so it's really important that we learn to feed on the Word of God, that the hunger for the Word of God, that we begin people, because not to be dependent upon me or any one of us in this room, but we let them go as disciples and, and feed on the Word, because what happens, we're, we're, we're wanting the food of natural nutrition and so forth. We learn that the food that, and Jesus said, you eat my body, drink my blood, you will what? Never die. And he was speaking physical because at that point in time, he just fed 5,000. So inside us, the hunger for the word should be so hungry that it fills our soul and our body. The Spirit's there revealing who we are. And that hunger just renews everything inside of us. So the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Okay, let's go over to the next scripture and, and carry will verify this. This scripture has really radically changed my life and on every podcast that we do, uh, it's generally one of the key scriptures in there. Is, and I can remember years ago when I, I, I did a teaching uh, with, a, with a men's group and, uh, and I go, ooh, uh, this almost sounds like heresy to some extent. Uh, th now this is Colossians 3, 1 through 4 in the Passion Translation. And, and what I've done here is personalize it. And I think it's really important we look at the scriptures, put your name in there, put, put uh, I and me, and, and, and because many times we're looking out into the future rather than looking and personalizing what the Word, word of God is really saying, uh, saying to, to me right now. And so Christ's resurrection is my resurrection too. See, the way, the, the way, it, reads, the way it reads is your resurrection too. Well, let's make it personal. It's my resurrection Two, okay. Christ's resurrection is my resurrection too. This is why I yearn for all that is above, for that's where Christ sits enthroned at the place of all power, honor, and authority. Who's sitting with Christ? I am. I am. We're sitting with Him too, with all the power, honor, and authority, with everything underneath His feet. So we're sitting there with Him too. So, and so, so this is why I yearn for all that is from above. All that is from above. And so, verse 2, yes, I feast. Now, this is really neat. Yes, I feast on all the treasures, all the treasures of the heavenly realm. And guess who's the treasure that Jesus came to find? Yeah, to find, we're the treasure that he came to find. And he gave his life. He gave up his life. I went through his life to, to redeem this treasure. So, so yes, I feast on all the treasures. of. By the way, this is so much fun with you all. You all get it. You all get it. And that's, that's so much fun. Uh, yes, I feast on all the treasures of the heavenly realm and fill my thoughts. My thoughts with what? Heavenly realities. Now, here it comes. Not with the, the news of this world the distractions of the natural realm that we're just, we're just feeding, just feeding and getting angry and bitter about and offended. It's so easy that we get offended. We walk in that spirit of offense so much. And we just took a, our, our company through uh, the book, Unoffendable, suggest it to you. Oh my God. It, it was, it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, he was, he was offending me all the way through it till the last chapter. <laughs> And, and so, and we walk in that spirit of offense. Jesus was unoffendable. Unoffendable. So we want to walk with that. Now, verse 3 here. My crucifixion. <laughs> We've been crucified with Christ. and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. So my crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now my true life is hidden away in God in Christ. They're pretty powerful verses, aren't they? And particularly when we, we personalize it, 
So now here's the verse that really started getting me even also is, and as Christ himself is seen. Now, let, let me ask this question. What's more powerful, what you see or what you don't see? See, you all know the answers. But if you went out on the street and said, what's more powerful, what you see or you don't see, we'd say, what you see. Because which one created the other? The unseen created the seen. And we have the unseen living. So, so as Christ himself is seen, the scenes, because we have now the unseen ability to see the, the seen, the unseen, as Christ is seen for who he really is. So we have to see Christ for who he really is. Who I really am will also be revealed. So if we're wanting to know who we are, we have to know who Christ is. As this Christ is revealed and seen for who he is, who I really am will also be revealed. Isn't that powerful? And it's not finished yet. Look at the rest of the verse. It tells us who we are. For I am, I am, I am now one with him in his glory. That's not a wait and see, die to get the glory, die to get this resurrected body. The resurrected body, we have that now. Oh, by the way, I'm taking some of your now stuff, Loretta. Because the gospel is a now gospel. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, it's all talking about who? The revelation of Jesus. And as Jesus is seen for who he is, who I really am will also be revealed. Because for I am now one with him in his glory. Doesn't that tie it all together? And by the way, since y'all are in such agreement, um, this, this, this is the Passion Translation. Um, have have y'all heard of the uh, uh, Mirror Translation? Okay, boy, it, it's a study Bible, and let me tell you what, it reveals Jesus now. It's speaking the language that we have, and it's a study Bible. It's a Mirror, mirror Bible, Mirror Bible. Uh, and so you can, get it, you can get the app and download it, and, and I, I copy and paste and put it in Word, and just, oh, it's just uh, this morning at 2 o'clock in, in the book of James, just, just reading what, what, it, what it means. And take the different, tra- see, this is the other part, is take the different translations, allow the Holy Spirit, what's this word really saying to us? And so um, one of the scriptures we did on a podcast was, was, thy word have I hidden in my heart that I would not sin against you. I'm going, hidden in my heart? Why, why do I want it hid in my heart? Well, the word hidden is treasure. <laughs> I'm going, oh, so I'm his treasure yeah, in his heart, that, and, 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 and then I'm not going to sin, and the sin is to think lower than you really made me. I am, the, I am with you now. And so when we think lower, so his, we are his treasure. And I'm going, oh my gosh, just look at these words are so important. And again, that's where you can learn... See, because our goal as disciplers is disciple to get people to read the Word of God and, and, and challenge it. And, and even not listen. We, we listen to man, but we say, is that really the truth? Does that agree with the Holy Spirit? Because he is true. He is true. Isn't that powerful? That's why I wanted to give this to you. I want you to have that. And Carrie, I don't know if we can do this, but hopefully those people that are online, we can give that and download so they can get this too. Uh, so let's flip on, on to the other, the other one. And this, this was revelation for me uh, years ago in the revelation of righteousness. And a lot of times when I do teaching, uh, I like to have people stand up and say, well, who are you? And, 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 and the word is, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And, and so, and, and then I, there's just so much around just, this is 2 Corinthians 5 and just uh, so much in just the whole chapter there. But, and, and again, because we know, therefore, and again, this, this is that third greatest historical event is the redemption. Is therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and we sang this just now too, the new creation has come. It's not a new creation tomorrow. It came the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice in, in it and be glad. That day has come. And it's being revealed to us now. It's being revealed now. Uh, the old is gone. The new is here. That's a now scripture. This is a now. All this is from God. So this is the go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. So all this is from God who reconciled us uh, to himself through, the, through Christ and gave us the what? The ministry of 
Okay, so we're in the ministry of... And what's crying out for reconciliation? Everything. Everything. The work that we do, the work that we do, everything we do is crying out because it's broken and we're here to help fix it and redeem it to God's perfect plan that He has. And we're waiting for sons to, to manifest the earth to recognize the role that we're in the ministry of reconciling everything to Him to bring the kingdom of God to earth. And how is he going to do that? He needs a human body to walk around in to show the joy of the Lord and bring the light of God to do that. So, so we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Okay, how about that? It's right there. As though God were making his appeal through us. Is he making his appeal through us? Yeah. So you can personalize that too. Uh, we employ you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. God, now here it comes. And, and again, I love the so that's in the scripture. That's why I could have put, put this little. God made him, Jesus, who had, uh, had no sin to be sin for us so that, so that what? We could become, we become the righteousness of God and so forth in Christ Jesus. <laughs> when I heard that years ago, oh, wow. So that sin consciousness, that tree of death and sin consciousness, because again, that's being taught a lot, that performance thinking, uh, it's a gift that we receive is the gift of righteousness. And so he's made us righteous, clean, holy, uh, uh, spotless in, in, in the soul and the body when we recognize that, because we know the spirit, soul, and body work together with the divine nature of God living in us now. We've been made righteous. We are the righteousness of God. So when I say to you, who are you? You say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So who are you? I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You guys are too easy. You get, you get it. And a lot of times, if I teach this over like a 13-week class, I had one lady, after, after about 12 hours of it, she, she finally stood in the middle of the class. I get it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You all already get it. That's why we can go out and give it away because we get it that's the important part of what we're doing here okay let's flip on over to the next verse which is ephesians 2 6 and and again it, it, you see on the left side there is uh you know we we die we died with christ we're resurrected with christ we ascended with christ and we're sitting with christ Come on, I, I never forget the first time I taught that in, 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 a, in a Bible study, and I'm going, oh my gosh, are they going to think this is heresy? Yeah, I, I never forget that. And, 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 and again, here's Ephesians 2 6 in the, in, the, in the Passion Translation. He raised us up with Christ, the exalted one, and we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm. Now, doesn't that just fit with the Colossian scripture we just had? You know, so we ascended with him into the glorious perfection and authority of the heavenly realm, and we are now co-seated as one with Christ. Is there any confusion on that? There's, that's pretty, pretty clear. That, that, that's, a now, that's a now, isn't it? Yeah. Now, let me flip, you on, flip on over to the next page. Now, this happens to be the mirror translation, and it's a, set, it's a study Bible, and so they give a little, some footnotes here. And so, and, and again, this is something I put it. We, we have the legal right to be co-seated with Jesus. So, and then this is verse 6 again of Ephesians 2, 6. We are co-included in his resurrection. We are also co-elevated in his ascension to be equally pres present in the throne room of the heavenly realm where we are co-seated with him in his executive authority. We are fully represented in Christ Jesus. So now here's a part of a little, the footnote in the study. But we have waited. <laughs> and, and again, there's some humor many times in some of his footnotes, I, which I, I just kind of laugh. Uh, we have wasted so much time trying to get there when there is where we are to begin with. Isn't that kind of good? Uh, our joint position in Christ defines us. This can never again be a distant goal to reach through religious devotion or striving, but of our immediate location. Come on. Doesn't that say, you all get this. See, that's the point. 
We, we got, see, because we have had, let's go work to get to God when it's receiving the gift of, of our identity, of, what, uh, of that treasure that he redeemed us. Isn't, isn't that powerful? Okay, and then this, this is one, uh, flip on over to the next one, which is, uh, which is uh, Psalms 103. When I came to Christ 40 years ago, I got discipled in business because the church wasn't open. I wanted to, I wanted to get fed now. And so, so uh, and, and I happened to be our, one of our business managers was a retired army chaplain. And, and so I said, hey, I heard the, the voice of the Lord last night. He said, he loves me. And, and again, I grew up in church. I was going to church, but I heard the voice. And I said, what's this all about? So, so he started discipling me in business. And, and, and with that, every small group of men or women, whatever I could go to, I had such a hunger for the word of God. Um, and this is one of the scriptures he, he, uh, he gave me is, is uh, Psalms 103. Uh, and this is verse one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I said that probably 10,000 times. And it was, not, it was years later that I realized there's a verse two. There's a verse three. There's a verse four. And even this week, you know, one of the revelations is, 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 uh, uh, is, 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 is blessed, but, but at the same time, you know, is, is glorify the Lord, glorify, bring glory to him uh, uh, in, with our pra- and praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. There's, so to some extent, even the word blessed to me has, it, it's kind of, it's meant for me this way when it's, we're, what we're speaking here is to glorify the glory. Uh, so, so bless the Lord, oh my soul, uh, and, and, and bless this one. Bless the Lord, oh my, in this verse two, and forget not all of his benefits. So, so, so there's a benefit package that comes here. So, so it's really important because, because, because we have this benefit package. And the first thing he does is what? Forgives how much? All our sins. Now, here's what we got to get here. Because we, we get that first one. How about the second one? Who heals how much? All. <laughs> Do we believe that? Who redeems my life, personal life, your life, from the, the destruction. And the destruction is what? Death. Remember? Sin and death. And does what? Crowns us with his, his tender love and kindness and his mercies. So what a benefit package here. So, so here we go. We opened up talking about the most powerful thing we have is our mouth. And who satisfies my mouth, our mouth, with good things, good things, life things, that we're speaking life things. Now, this is the verse that about five years came off my life when I got this. There's a so that here. All of the benefits are here for a so that. So the so that is what? Your youth is renewed like the eagles. So the spirit speaking to the soul, the soul saying, hey, never die. Cells in our body are being renewed. The nervous systems, we have the blood of who in us. Jesus, we have that blood. It's a life-giving blood. We have the food. We eat, on his, we eat on his word. We drink the water that is ever flowing through us. And it restores every part of our body, soul, and spirit. Okay, this is something we do in each of our podcasts. And let, this is such a lively group. This, you're an easy group. I don't, I don't have to convince you of anything. You're already there. And that's what's, so, that's what's so neat. However, we're to take this message out. Go. Go. So let's all stand up here. And let's just read this. Because this, this is an important part as we finish uh, the podcast. Uh, is, is, and we read these out loud. Because these are declarations of our legal rights. These are our legal rights. Okay? You ready? I am a special race as a child of God, as a citizen in the kingdom of God, in the body of Christ, in a kingdom of priests. Hmm. I belong to the family of God. I can enter into God's presence boldly now. I have been recreated into God's image and likeness of love. I manifest and experience heaven on earth now with righteousness, peace, and joy. I am restored, 
redeemed and recreated back with God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit living in me now. I have the Word of God dwelling in me. I have the crown of righteousness on my head and wear the garment of praise, which is my robe of righteousness. I have the legal rights and privileges to use the name of Jesus. I have legal authority as a believer over the principalities, powers, and rulers of the kingdom of darkness. I have through the Holy Spirit living in me the resurrected power to cast out demons and to lay hands on the sick, and they are healed. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. God be you, Lord. Um, Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. You know, I, I have often said, but Glenn just put it into words much better than I ever am able to say it uh, because he's quoting the Bible. But I've always said, you know, what if we actually believed our Bible? I, I know we all are Bible believers and we, we stretch sometimes at some of the things that the Bible actually is there. And I always tell people, I said, you know, at least at least in my two cents, the whole thing about I can't save you. That's not up to me. That's up to the Lord. I can give you the information. God gave you free will. You're going to have to decide for yourself, but you need to have the information and figure it out so you can make the correct decision. And so what happens a lot of times, we'll get like some of the basics, but then we'll, we'll kind, of, kind of groan at <laughs> some of the things that God promises the Lord. And I go to people like, it's either true or it's not. You know, people love to parse out the Bible and go, well, this chapter is true, but I'm not sure about that. Fine. Now you're God, right? I mean, by definition, you're, you're now grading God. So, but if, if we stand on the word of God, it is the truth. And that's what I believe. That's what I believe. If God said so, that's good for me. I don't have to answer every question. You know, there are things I can go, I don't know, but I know who does. That's enough. And so the, the key point is, you know, when it says things like faith of a mustard seed and things like that, those are the areas. And so as, as Glenn so eloquently put it, you know, when we talk about what's our role here, why are we here? This isn't just for us to edify us. This is so we can go and make disciples throughout the earth. And this church in particular, I'm talking about Community Gospel Truth Church right here in Melbourne, Florida. This is one of those church, churches where you absolutely are discipled to get the to get so you can go because sometimes how many know you you're probably the only Jesus somebody's going to see and if and if you don't speak up they'll walk right by to hell you know i mean it's it's that's where it is so with that we're going to take a break i think glenn will be here go get him to sign your book ask him a question whatever what read the book the book is a lot of fun and and we we talk about this sometimes on the podcast is that the last uh, pages of the book is a series of affirmations. And these are all biblical. See, this is the point. You know, you're not going, well, I am great. I'm great through Christ, you know. But, but these are the things that are true. And you need to remind, because the enemy is what? Always trying to come from the other side and go, yeah, but, yeah, but. He's got a big butt, you know? <laughs> all right. So with that, let's take a break. We're going to have a coffee break and we'll come back. God bless you guys. So it's so exciting to be here on the, um, you know, this is, uh, this is not like somebody woke up 20 minutes ago and said, let's create an American Evangelistic Association. This is now 69 years of AEA serving the kingdom of God. And uh, we're about to go into our 70th year. Uh, and I can't wait to see what God is going to do with our with our group reaching out. Um, so thank you for being here. Thank you for being part of uh, everything that's going on here. If you're watching online, we thank you for uh, for taking the time to be part of what the AEA is doing. Uh, we were talking at the early part of this that uh, last year's theme, which I had to go back and research, was preparing for God's plan. And this year, the word of the Lord for us is let's go. So we've been we've been in preparation, which means we're studying our Bible. We're getting we're getting uh, uh, getting the word in us. Uh, we just had a great session with uh, with uh, Glenn Reppel, 
uh, where he was reminding us what God says about us. Now, do we have the audacity to believe what God says about us? That's really that's really the challenge. And and we were just talking. I was talking with Doctor Doctor Ed can answer during the break and said, you know, that's really the challenge because the enemy is coming every day with fiery darts and foolishness. And so that's why we have to put on the armor of God every day, right? So you got to stay. You got to stay in the Word. So with that, that's what I'm really excited about. Uh, the AEA is blessed to have so many um, really gifted people who are called of the Lord who are living lives of service. Our next speaker is one of those who I almost get exhausted running down <laughs> all the different things that she is able to accomplish. Uh, she has served in a a, a, a a church uh, that is in a very difficult, you know, we're very fortunate here in Florida because uh, even during COVID, they considered a church to be a, uh, what was it they called it, a necessary, uh, there was a essential, thank you, an essential thing. I mean, like other places would say, well, the liquor store is essential. I'm like, are you serious? <laughs> How about the church being essential? I think it's pretty essential. You know, but 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 you could be in a state like uh, Dr. Loretta Yanicelli comes from Boston, Massachusetts, and that's a state where I hear all the time. I hear it from Dr. Ed. I hear it from uh, uh, from Bishop Charles and Dr. Judy. They're kind of on the front lines of a, a bunch of hateful people up there. I, I don't know. I mean, why why they're so anti-church or anti-Christ is uh, is really a mystery to me. Because if we're just foolish in our little thinking and we have our little delusion. And that's all it is. Why are you so mad at us? What, why are we so threatening to you? What, what, is our, what is your problem? I mean, are we that harmful? Are you scared of us? What is this deal? So, but in addition to running uh, and working for many years, uh, uh, co-pastoring a church up there, she has Equip Care Ministries and is discipling and working with leaders. She's involved in chaplaincy. Uh, she's involved in the Chesapeake Bible College and Seminary because she is the director of admissions, runs an academic team up there. And if all that wasn't enough, then she's in the AEA and she's also coming down here to share a word with us. I can't wait for this. The time is now. So the time is now for Dr. Loretta Yanicelli. Amen. Amen. Okay, beloved saints, we've made the plans, we've written them down, we've put them on the tablets, and now it's time to, let's go! Are you ready? <laughs> ready, set, go! Okay, here we go. So, my name's Loretta Yanicelli, for those of you who may not know me, and thank you, Dr. Carey and Tammy Fink, just for all that AEA does. Thank you so much to Bishop Jerry, Dr. Jerry, and his beautiful wife, Pastor Maria, with Community Gospel Truth Church, who hosts this every year. And it's just an honor and a joy to come down and really refresh, renew, refuel. And so just a, I know you've prayed. I know you prayed. I know we re-prayed. But I'm just going to confer with what everybody has already said is, God, use our vessels. Use me today and allow the Holy Spirit to speak your word of truth through me. Let the Spirit move on the hearts and minds of those that need to hear it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if there was one mission, one mission at all today that I would want to impress upon all of you, a takeaway, one big takeaway is that we need to stay vigilant as the body of Christ about our inward spiritual development with God. Glenn Reppel just talked about it. He talked about the promises, who we are, our identity in Christ. There's many promises that God has given us, but we need to foster, not busy work, but foster a, an intense spiritual relationship with him so we can hear him, we can identify him. So no matter what the time, no matter what the season, no matter what the struggle, no matter what the trial, no matter what the hurdle, okay, we are personally ready and prepared to not fall away. That's the topic really of my message today is the time is now. And we're going to take a look at some things. But first of all, I brought you all a gift. And so did Glenn Reppel with his amazing book. But there's a QR code on the next slide. If you'll put up the next slide, the time is now QR code. I prepared a minister and leaders renew workbook and journal for us to accomplish just that, the mission of today, foster your inward development with God. 
It's a free resource. Uh, you can download it from the QR code, work on it later. It's a reflection workbook to really, really give you an opportunity to give yourself a year-end spiritual checkup. As leaders, as ministers, listen, in 2 Peter okay, 3.18, this is what the Bible tells us. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. And for us that are called to grow in grace, we also have to know that we're saved by grace. And to be saved by grace, we have to continue to grow in grace. And so as disciples of Jesus, I want you all to know we are here to live a life of love. We're here to live a life of loving God, loving our neighbors, right? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the time is now, okay? All too often, the busyness of our day-to-day lives, no matter what they are, we might work secularly, we might have busy families, we might have jam-packed schedules, but we cannot let the busyness of our day-to-day lives crowd out the two highest priorities that have been given to us, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love one another. And these are the two checkpoints, okay? So as a token of my gratitude, take the workbook, use it, reflect on it, do a season and a time of reflection uh, through the Renew workbook. So here we go. For us impactful leaders, we cannot allow the, the intense demands of pastoral ministries to crowd out and distract us also from our own needs and our own longings. Okay, we have... There's a drawing that God gives us from the Spirit. He calls to us that we need to go into those deep places and those deep wells, the spiritual inward development. So we're going to talk about that today. And so, okay, here we go. Let's go, right? Let's go. Repeat after me. Let's go. All right, all right. I did some research. And basically, some of the research I found was quite disturbing. Uh, The biggest issues facing the world today the biggest issues facing the world today. Wars, nuclear holocaust, threats of nuclear holocaust. Next slide. Destructive artificial intelligence, AI. Oh, there's some AI going on, and we're not sure what to do with all this in the church, but it could be destructive. It really could be destructive, and we have to watch. Rumors of the new world reset, right? Global economy, one world government, all the end times talk going on. There's increased environmental and natural disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes. And guess what? 2023, whether you realize it or not in the United States, was the year to date who has recorded the most natural disasters. 2023. Here's what we got. As of October 10th, 24 confirmed weather and climate disasters with losses, get this, each and every one of these 24 had a loss of over a billion dollars that hit the United States of America. These events included one drought, two flooding events, 18 severe storm events, one tropical cyclone, one wildfire, and one winter storm. That's from the National Center of Environmental Information, 2023. It's here, it's starting, it's happening. All of the signs that are predicted are starting to converge. Okay, other risks, biotech, the GMOs, the genetically modified organisms that they're producing, the pandemic. Oh, dear Lord, save us. Get us get the word pandemic out of my vocabulary. I don't want to hear it anymore. Molecular nanotechnology. Listen, I had to look up these things. I'm like, what are these words? What in the world is going on? But that's new biological weapons being produced. Biodiversity loss, what's that? Ex, it's an over-exploitation of habitat or invasive species, pollution. So what are the greatest um, effects and the greatest issues facing the church today? What are we in the church? So we have this going on in the world. Next slide, what's going on with the church? False gospel, twisted doctrine, okay? Strange fire, right? The um, Aaron's sons. Uh, It was talked about in the Old Testament. A falling away from the message of the gospel, a watering down of biblical truths, especially concerning who the person of Christ is, especially a falling away from the position and purpose of the church. 
churches don't even know what they're what they're about anymore what they're doing they're just on a bandwagon of doing their own thing compromise big word a compromise to change with the times and the culture of the day and here's one glenn Reppel talked about it leading others into works-based religion and how many of us know churches and pastors that avoid accountability they avoid correcting their own congregants things run rampant in the church lately i don't know how it, it happens but they avoid accountability and there's an avoidance of the correction of sin there's religious trauma spiritual abuses that have happened and occurred gender sexual diversity all of these things that are affecting the church today cause increased pressure i feel there's there's trouble a brewing you know but the time is now okay so what do the clergy face what is the clergy facing? Job-related stress, financial issues, uh, relationship troubles, time management problems, feelings of loneliness and isolation. There's political, huge political and cultural divisions going on right now. A declining church attendance, ineffective discipleship models. Thank God there's a pastor that's doing discipleship. Keep up the great work. Um, there's all sorts of other things. Um, developing leaders, developing you know, volunteers. These are the concerns of the church today. So what does the Bible tell us about staying strong and staying encouraged and staying hopeful? Hopeful. How do we become and stay effective as leaders amongst the body of Christ? Well, there are three wonderfully great scripture writers that I've pulled. There's many more, but these three to me give some significant guidance to the church on how to remain hopeful during hard times. One is King David, Psalm 121. He tells us, lift up your eyes to the mountains. Where does our help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Listen, today, a lot of people are worshiping the things that are created instead of worshiping the creator. We will lift up our eyes to the Lord, he who has created heaven and earth. So thank you. King David's always, always good for solid encouragement. The prophet Isaiah, the next one, Isaiah, we know the scripture, 40, 31, but those who open the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. You know, Glenn said something in his first thing that really stuck with me. And one of them was, we are watching and taking in all this stuff and all this junk and all this news and all this. It makes us bitter. It makes us angry. It makes us divisive. And as we go through taking in these heavy doses every day, you know, we can't replenish correctly, in my opinion. It just stays stuck in there. and We become this, you know, and our beautiful worship leader articulated it great. What's our continence? What are we walking around that's coming out of us? But the prophet Isaiah said, we'll soar on wings like eagles if we focus on the things of the Lord who will renew our strength. The apostle Paul in Romans 5 also encouraged us, not only so, but also the, we can glory in our sufferings. Why? Because suffering for us per Bible truth is going to produce perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and our hope will not put us to shame. So let's say it right now. The time is now. The time is now. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Listen, beloved. One of my biggest fears is that my faith would be shipwrecked. That is truly one of my own biggest fears is that I'd get so discouraged that I'd just quit the ministry. It can be heavy, so many hardships, so much heaviness, so much grief, so much loss. And you know what? I've seen some really crazy things these recent days. Pastors who don't care anymore. I don't care. Let them do what they want. What? <laughs> you, you know, I just they, they don't have the capacity anymore to fight the battle. They just let things go within their churches. They don't love anymore. They don't want to deal with people. They don't want to deal with situations anymore. They are, have problems dealing with their own lives themselves. Churches and leaders compromising on doctrine. The good called bad. The bad called good. Lifelong Christians I've seen betraying Bible truth and trading truth for a lie. 
what in the world is happening? These are lifelong mature Christians falling away like nothing. Lifelong friends betraying one another. I, due to ego, due to self-righteousness, due to pride. People were falling away left and right. I've seen gossip and slander destroy ministries. Personally, I was ghosted. I was ghosted personally by a friend of 35 years that something just wasn't to, to the liking and they just decided I'm washing my hands. No conversation, no bear with each other's burden, no love, just cold, shut the door. And it's like, what just happened? What is going on? Not even a conversation, not a thought, not a discussion of counting the cost. Count the cost of what we're doing. And the worst one is I've witnessed people blaming. Is there a blame thing going on today? They are doing all sorts of things, and then they blame and project you and accuse you of doing exactly what they're doing. And it's like, what is, what in the world? I have never seen anything like it. I'm like, wow, you know, this is the ultimate con job of all times. Honestly, I've never seen anything like it. They're doing all this. They don't want to take any responsibility for self. They just want to continue to pour out their, their venom. And if you even try to, to question, it's what it, the blame. Here comes the blame. Here comes the projection. But Jesus warned such times would come. Jesus warned there would be a world. And this, is, this has been, this word in and of itself right here has been on my heart for months. A world where love would wax cold. A world coming. Now, I'm not saying we're knee deep into the revelation because if you are like me and we believe the same things that we believe, the church will be out of here. Okay? But there is a onset of the birthing pains and we are going to go through some things and we're going to face a world where love would wax cold. There would be a falling away, an upside down world where good could be considered bad and bad good. But now is the time, saints. Now is the time, my beloved, more than ever to be vigilant and walking in the spirit of God and remaining in the spirit of God. There's a subtleness to the deception of the enemy. Like I've seen, like I said, I had a friend, 35 years friendship. How in the world could the end result ever come to this if we believe in the same God? How? I don't understand it. But there's a falling away. So we need to remain in the spirit. And I would pray to God, God, protect us. God, protect each, protect your army, God. Protect our minds, God, that we're never subtly deceived, that we never fall prey to falling away that we will not be deceived, our minds will not be deceived, and our love will never, ever, ever wax cold. Please, God, keep in me a contrite heart. So Paul goes on to give us some practical applications, just some practical applications where believers can prevent falling away from the faith. Here's a few. One of the main themes of the book of Galatians that Paul writes impresses how the righteous shall live by faith. We must stand firm in truth of our faith. This is key. Once you open the crack and you go down a little bunny trail, the floodgates are coming. Okay, you won't know what to stand on or what to believe anymore. We must stand firm in the truth of our Bible, the truth of the promise. Any compromise on legalism or a mixture of human effort with grace, especially especially on salvation, will lead to heresy. I'm telling you, Paul gives us the contrast. Saints, beware here, beware, beware, beware. This is our checklist, our checklist to ensure we are not drifting, we're not subtly deceived and falling away. Galatians 5.16, please, through 26. But I say, this is Paul, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. That's interesting. In order to keep you from doing whatever you want. 
whatever our flesh wants, we just want it and we want it now. No. But if you're led in the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. Here they come. Checklist. Some of these are big ticket items. Big, you know, sin is sin is sin. We don't have categories of sin. But some of these, you know, you would say these are big ticket items. Sexual immorality, impurity, and decent behavior. Now we get into idolatry. Kind of subtle at times. What are you following more than God? Witchcraft. Oh, and by the way, rebellion is a form of witchcraft. Are you rebelling against the word of God? Are you rebelling against truth? Okay. Are you rebelling and want your way? I always say, sometimes I'm in prayer groups or I'll visit other churches and I'll hear people pray and it, I'll just, it'll, it'll hit me. I'll take her out, Lord. That's not godly prayer. That's witchcraft. Does anybody understand that that's witchcraft when you're wishing harm or trying to ask God to cancel somebody out? We're supposed to, and again, Glenn called it. We have a ministry of reconciliation, and I'll talk about that later in my sermon. Anyway, idolatry, witchcraft. Host, now here we go. Little more subtle. Hostilities. Hmm. Are you hostile toward anybody? Do you have a brother or sister? Well, sometimes justifiably against the cray-cray of the world, but separate from that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish, uh, selfish ambitions. We want it our way. I think I was here the last time I was here. I preached about, I want this, Lord, and it wasn't producing fruits of the Spirit. And God was saying, go here. And I was like, no, I want, I, I'm, I'm, I like it here. I'm staying here. I'm staying right here, you know, but it's not my way. It's God's way. We can't have selfish ambition. Dissensions. There's another one. Is there any dissension in the church? Factions? Envy? Do we think of, oh, the church down the street has 500 people and I'm going to, I'm going to strive. I'm going to get that. That's striving and doing kind of your own thing. And so we don't want to get into that. Drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, says Paul, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is why reconciliation is so important, saints. We cannot be subtly wooed away to be mean toward one another. We can't have angst and division. I don't see it in the Bible where there's any examples of where Jesus shut the door on people, except, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, except hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And so, but the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there is no law. Now those who believe in Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, if we live by the Spirit, brothers and sisters, let us follow the ways of the Spirit as well. This was very intriguing. This sums up to this. Let's not be boastful. Let's not challenge one another. Interesting. And let's not envy one another. Good, kind advice from Paul. Do you line up with the love and the joy and the gentleness and loving God and loving others? Okay, sidebar. I love this. This was such a cool example I heard in a commentary. When you look at the biblical ministry of Jesus Christ, okay, he was always gentle. He helped. What do you need? What can I do for you? Think of the woman at the well. Think of the woman caught in adultery. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you either. Why is the church so mean-spirited and condemning of one another? That's not God. I really don't believe it. He was gentle. He was kind. He received all kinds of people, all kinds of people. But oh boy, was he outraged when it came to hypocrisy. Those religious leaders made him flip. Okay, really. And we're going to look at it. But listen, one of the most scariest verses in the Bible, I don't know about you, I've studied and I've uh, loved the word of God, but one of the most scariest, scariest, scariest scriptures in the Bible is Matthew 7, where Jesus states to believers, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but he who does the will of my Father. And Jesus declares to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. God help us. Later in Matthew 24, Jesus gives another warning, okay, on the Mount of Olives. This was really cool because in Matthew 23, which I'll get to in a minute, he was really doing his flip out on the whoa, 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 hypocrisy, whoa. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but he comes out of the temple and the apostles in in the first um, scripture one and two in Matthew start to talk about, um, look at the temple and look at this. And he says, not one stone will be left. Not one. And then he sat later on the Mount of Olives. Think about this. Just envision this in your mind. Here he is sitting on the Mount of Olives, the exact same place he will return. The exact same place. He will come back one day and put his foot on the Mount of Olives. And he's schooling his his disciples. And they came to him privately saying, tell us, tell us, God, tell us, Lord, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And you know, many are questioning that today. We're seeing an increased activity in Israel, the war going on. Everyone's saying, oh my goodness, is this, you know, is this leading to the, you know, the 10 kings? Is this leading to the one world government? Is this leading to the war of Gog, Mega? All the things we know in our end times prophecy. But imagine Jesus saying to them and sitting there, on the Mount of Olives. And this is what he says, Matthew 24, verse 4 to 13. Take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you, a.k.a. do not fall away. (laughs) For many will come in my name, saying I'm the Christ, and they'll try to deceive many. And you'll hear wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. Okay, see that you're not troubled. You don't need to be glued to the TV and see that you're not troubled. Don't give up going to church. Don't give up praying and fellowship. Don't be troubled, okay? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places, and all of these are the beginning sorrows. Verse 10. And then, say and then, and then, didn't Glenn say so that, anyway, and then many will be offended. Look at that. Many will be offended. Many will betray one another. Many will hate one another. I mean, for me, sometimes I get chills because again, I'm seeing people around me that are, that are just not who they are. What is happening, right? But there's many false prophets that will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. So be encouraged. So how many times have we seen offense and a lack of love amongst the body? I'm here today to challenge you. I don't want to sit like on this heaviness. I really wanted to preach about something else. But he gave me a word of challenge and a word of warning in a time such as now to not let all this craziness cancel what we know to be true. Do not panic, okay? Do not fall away and go believing some other thing. And and do not wax cold. Let your love multiply, okay? God doesn't want division. He doesn't want strife, but he wants the fruits of the Spirit. So in the previous chapter, as I said, right before he's sitting here with his apostles, he instructed them, the Pharisees, woe, woe to those missing the point of love and grace and faith. These today are really a wise contrast for us today as well on what not to do. So I'm going to just very quickly go through these, but Jesus was really upset. He was really upset with the religious teachers of his day. And many times, you know, not for nothing, I thought, how could they miss it? He's right there before them. Every prophetic prophecy come into fulfillment. How many more? I mean, they know the scriptures. How could Israel have missed it? 
How could leaders of intellect completely be checked out, completely be checked out and miss it thoroughly? It was their self-righteousness. This is what we have to guard against, beloved. It was self-righteousness and hypocrisy that they were completely deceived. Look with me now on the mistakes of these leaders, just very quickly. Some background of the woes, just to give you um, a little bit of like a one-liner. Jesus prefaces these woes by explaining to the disciples that they should obey the teachings of the Jewish leaders. However, they're not to model their behavior. They're not to model the behavior of the Pharisees. He told them as they did not practice what they preached. They didn't. That's Matthew 24, 23, 3. So the woes of Christ, very quickly. He condemned the scribes and the Pharisees for keeping people out of the kingdom of heaven. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter. And you, you don't even let those enter who are trying to get in, right? And the whole thing about this was, it, if you break down these woes, it came back to repentance and faith. It came back to the basic belief in Jesus. Jesus Christ is the door to admission into the kingdom of heaven. There's no other way. He is the door. And so the, these Pharisees shut the door. Not only would they not get in, okay? But everybody else around them, he was d diminishing them from knowing Jesus. Okay, here's the next woe. Jesus condemned the leaders for teaching their convert the same hypocrisy. They led their converts into religious works. And he says, making them twice as much of a child of hell. <laughs> Think about this. He's getting, now he's heated. He is heated. True righteousness, beloved. True righteousness becomes from the belief in Jesus as Messiah. That's it. He's the fulfillment of the scriptures. We don't have to work it up. We don't have to chase down works and earn credits. He is the way. Here's another woe. Jesus called the religious elite blind guides and blind fools. Hypocrites. They were blind to the true meaning of the scriptures. He says they quibbled and quabbled over irrelevant matters, finding loopholes. They were busy about all this little stuff and really missing true spiritual truth, the bigger things. So I thank God that we can know his truth and his truth sets us free, right? Here's another one, their hypocrisy and the practices of tithing. This is funny, okay? They diligently counted mint leaves, okay? To give one-tenth of everything, every little, little thing. But yet they neglected the most important things on justice and mercy and faithfulness to their own scriptures. They missed it, okay? Now Jesus gives hyperbole here, okay? He said they strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> they're, they're about these little things, these busy little things. But like the real big things, like loving your brother or sister, you miss it. How do you miss it? I don't know. <laughs> so here in these final ones, Jesus used um, these examples showing really ultimate hypocrisy. He compares them to a dish in a cup. Okay, you're spotless on the outside, but you're dirty on the inside. And what he was trying to say is their religious observances made them appear really clean and virtuous outwardly. But inwardly, he said, their hearts were filled with greed and self-indulgence. Are our hearts right, brothers and sisters? Check the heart, the motives of the heart. We could be doing a thousand great and wonderful things, but is our heart right? Or are our motives behind it right? Or is these things going to burn up, you know, at the, at the judgment seat of Christ? The motives weren't right. So whatever motives, you can do so many great things, but if, if it's with the wrong desire behind it, it's not worthy. So anyway, Jesus compared them to whitewashed tombs, okay, which look beautiful on the outside. Think of bones decayed and decrepit on the, but he said they were like the bones of the tombs, dead and everything unclean. And so what he was trying to say is that they appeared righteous on the outside, so holy, so holy, but inwardly they were spiritually dead. Spiritually dead, he didn't know them. The last one I want to share is the Pharisees also erected these monuments and these tombs to the prophets of old, okay? And basically he said, you know, 
your your ancestors like killed the prophets. Like, why are you acting like you don't know this? Like, you come from the same lineage. They all they killed every prophet. And, and, and what happens is, is they say, oh, if we would have lived in their day, we would have never done that. And so Jesus is like, you inherited your ancestors' wickedness, and you're following in their steps. So Jesus knew their hearts were evil, and that they were actually planning to kill him too. You know, and it's like, oh my gosh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, but saints of God, listen, let's go. Let's go. Here's where I want to encourage you. Let's go. The time is now for the church to really, really be on our A game. The woes of Matthew 23 were dire warnings then to the spiritual religious leaders of the day. And they are also very relevant to us today. Okay? We have to be mindful and we have to hold each other accountable against religious hypocrisy today. We're called to true godliness. We're called to sincere love. And we're called to enduring faith. These, we are called to this today, right now. We must endure. There's no place in our ministries. Here's a good one for pretension, for affectation, and for hypocrisy, which leads to woe. Now, if you're like me, like when I looked up all these catastrophic global warnings, I had to look up the word affection affectation actually affectation because i never heard that word before i'm like what is that word well it's a noun affectation is behavior speech or writing that's artificial designed to impress isn't that interesting it's artificial it has a motive behind it here's some of the the words that wikipedia gave me pretension artificiality insincerity posturing, posing, grandiosity, snobbery, airs, snootiness. Do you believe these are the words? Here's the other similar words, and on and on it goes. Facade, front, show, appearance, false display. And here's the final few, some synonyms. Confidence, smugness, snobbiness, complacency was in there. Haughtiness, egotism, vainness and self-satisfaction. I know this isn't like a really pretty wrapped word, but it's a timely word for the body of Christ that we are the soldiers. An army is rising up for end days ministry, and we need to be held true to it. We need to, we, God needs us. He, like we are the tabernacle that the Holy Spirit works through. We can't go off on some side deception or some detour. So, how can we avoid how can we avoid hypocrisy and i had to get the right pronunciation of this word my son would be proud of me cuz i say wrong pronunciations at times he's like that's not how that word that's not but i have a pittsburgh accent i come from pittsburgh and it you know it doesn't jive sometimes with the boston lingo and he's like what did you say <laughs> anyway so i had to look up the word religiosity <laughs> So the definition of religiosity is, this is what we don't want to be. We don't want hypocrisy. We don't want to be practicing religiosity, okay? But the definition of religiosity is the quality or state of being religious, feeling religious for our devotion. Well, what's wrong with that, I said. I looked up this word. I'm like, that sounds like we're, we're Christians. We should be religious, no? That's not bad, right? Well, one can get caught up in doing the right thing with the wrong reason and with the wrong motives. And we can subtly become spiritually dry, subtly not be in relationship with God anymore. And dryness can set in. So here are some signs. Here are some signs of religiosity, spiritual busyness. Isn't it funny? I, I always thought, you know what? I, I never liked, sometimes I heard, let me back up. <laughs> I heard others preach on the Martha Mary. And Martha had, hus, you know, Martha had hospitality. She wasn't doing anything really wrong, right? But he said, he's select, that Mary selected the better thing. 
and she was sitting at his feet and she was spiritually and inward. She was having a relationship with him and she wasn't going to miss the moment. And so it wasn't that she was, you know, Martha was doing anything wrong, but she was spiritually busy. She was busy and he was right there and she could have been right there. Lord, tell me something. Give me a word. Well, you know, give me revelation. Something, whatever Mary was enjoying sitting at the feet of Jesus, Martha was missing it. Okay. Religiosity, knowledge without love. Oh, there's a big one. Knowledge, spiritual truth. Oh, we've studied the word. I'm Dr. Loretta. I have all sorts of knowledge. But if I don't love my brother and sister, Jesus says, no way. It's that don't fly with him. And I'm like, really, that Matthew 7, like, God, don't ever say you didn't know me. Please don't ever, ever have me come face to face with you. And you say, sorry, you're not coming in. Go over there. I didn't ever know you. That scares the bejeebies out of me, okay? Here's another sign of religiosity. No spiritual power. No power. See, Paul said, I'm not coming with fancy words. I'm coming in demonstration. Healings will occur. Lives will be changed, right? If we're truly operating in the power of the the Holy Spirit, we will see evidence. There will be fruit and good fruit. Here's another sign of religiosity, spiritual blindness, being hypocritical, a legalistic perversion of truth. It was funny, and I didn't intend to tell this story, but boy, the Holy Spirit just plopped it right into my mind. My family and I took this big tour to Italy, and we went to Rome. And, And I'm thinking, wow, Rome, this is cool one of the holiest places right um in all of the world it's a monument you know the they have all the cathedrals and this and that and i'm gonna take this reflection and do italy on my own you know faith tradition and i was sitting in a corner and i think it was saint peter's square and i'm sitting there and it was so hot and i had just walked the steps those thousand steps to one of those churches and so i kicked off my flip-flops and out of nowhere these women dressed in black with long veils they attacked me (laughs) they came up and started screaming at me and yelling at me and i was with my husband at the time who's from italy and he starts screaming at them in italian all this stuff get out of here get out of here you crazy ladies leave my wife alone but it was a legalistic perversion of truth here was somebody sitting I'm reading my Bible and having a meditative moment with God on your holy ground and you're attacking me because I didn't have shoes on. I mean, really? Of all the tourism Rome sees, you're going to attack somebody because they kicked their shoes off in St. Peter's Square? It's a legalistic perversion of truth. So the time is now. Time is now. Time is now. Let's go. Let's go. Let's stop and take a hard look at ourselves. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it to please man? Is it to please God? Is it out of habit? Is it out of comfort? Is it out of obligation? Again, beloved, I prepared that workbook for you. It is a renewed journal for you to have a tangible way, a resource to take a minute and review and evaluate yourselves. We're all very busy, but look at your inward condition. Have a look back. Have a look now. Have a look ahead. What is God doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? It is it to is it for really to serve ourselves? Is it to be important? Is it because our mom and dad says so, and we were raised this way all our lives? Is it to or is it to serve God and is it to serve others? You heard the the saying before. You know, I don't want to be a statistic. I don't want to be a statistic of Matthew chapter seven. I do not want to be a statistic where God says he never knew me, okay? So I want to encourage all of you, when I look at, really, Matthew 23, 24, Galatians 5, fruits of the Spirit, God gives a very big distinction here. In conclusion, a big distinction here between intellectual hypocrisy versus relational practice hypocrisy versus true genuine love and faith and truth lasting faith genuine love looking at those woes okay he gave to the leaders of the day causes me to pause okay so beware listen to what he writes okay this is really chilling 
a chilling warning about true faith again. Jesus predicts that false Christian prophets will be coming. They'll be coming as wolves in sheep's clothing. That's Matthew 7, 15. They may use all the right God talk. They're going to use all the impressive displays of power, but they will not belong to the Lord. Beware of false prophets. Now we're in verse 15, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are as ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. So in other words, we can discern it. We can discern it in our spirits. We know truth. You can try to fake it till you make it, but we know, okay? We know, we can see. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father. Now on a sidebar, I could do a whole, I have a whole nother preaching seminar teaching on what is the will of God for us. And I'm just going to give you the six right out of the gate, just so you, you can hear them and know them. God doesn't want anybody to perish. It is the will of God that we receive salvation and that others are given the gift to know the gospel, an opportunity to know and be invited to the genuine gospel. God wants us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and experience his power. God gives us, here's a big word, sanctification. But what it truly means is that we are to grow to Christ likeness. In other words, change should be happening in our lives. We should be going in a direction where we're not perfect. I'm so not perfect. Absolutely not. But I can strive to be Christ-like and grow and know him deeper and, and more. Here's another thing God wants. He wants us to live on purpose. There's no coasting here. Submit to authority and live on purpose. You have a purpose. God wants us to realize that there's joy in suffering. The joy of the Lord will be our strength. And receive blessings through thankfulness. He wants us to be thankful. And he wants to give us blessings. These are the six things that are the will of God for us. But many will say to me in the day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons, Lord, in your name? Haven't we done wonders, God, in your name? And the scripture says, and then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Lawlessness. And if you go further, I mean, I sat in this for two months. The whole iniquity word. There's a lot to that. You worker of iniquity. And if you look what a worker of iniquity is, a lot of it has to do with a lack of love. God calls us to love. That's the distinguishing characteristic of true Christianity is love. Yes, even your enemies you're to love. So I hate to say it, brothers and sisters in Christ who are gossiping and slandering and tearing down others or causing rumors or making divide or making factions or turning this one against that one. Stop it. Please stop it. It's not God. Okay. You don't want to be in this category where he says, what? I thought as a religious leader, you'd take care of my child. Feed my sheep, the beautiful, worshipfully. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. Not destroy my sheep. Where have we come up with this concept? In, and it comes in a, in a confidence, in a, in, a, in a, they think that's power or something. I don't know. I don't understand it. Anyway, in conclusion, avoid the subtle danger. Be genuinely aligned to God's will. Believe, produce good works through the, for all for the glory of God. Not for show, not for us, not for an agenda, not because we have to, not because our pastor told us to. For the glory of God we live, okay? We don't want to stand in our own power. The marks of a true believer declare the love for God and the love for others. Again, remember, he was outraged by hypocrisy. Okay, get with God, check yourself. Here's a final thought, last slide. Ephesians 5, 
15 to 21. This is what Paul again encourages the believers. Again, a timely warning from Paul. So then, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but wise. Make the most of your time, because the days are evil. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is for you. Don't get drunk with wine and participate in all this debauchery of the world, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, I underlined this on my notes in red and red and red. Speaking to one another. Here it is again. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. Sing songs together. Make melody with your hearts to the Lord. Right? Let your heart be filled with joy and song and melody. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. To our God and Father. And subject yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. There you go. There's the judgment seat. Fear. Matthew 7, fear. I don't want to be turned away. We don't want to be turned away. Speak love to one another. Subject yourselves to one another. Care enough about one another that you don't just wash your hands of it and go on your merry way. No. Subject yourselves. For me, God, I must humble myself. I must remain constant and remembering who God desires me to be in him. No matter who upsets me or pisses me off or any of these things, I'm not coming out at you. I am going to shut my mouth. I am. I'm just trying to be real. I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to pray. And, you know, I've come up with four things that have helped me. When people have come against me and people have talked about me or rumored about me or done anything that wasn't true about me, I could have lashed back. I could have torn them down. I could have done all sorts of things that the old Loretta would have done. And I, I, but mm, instead what I do is I immediately forgive them. I immediately pray for them. I will not disparage them or rumor back on them. And I'll bless them. I'll bless them. I'll find a way if it's two or three years later, I'll bless them. I'll bless them. So, beloved, we are called to true godliness, we're called to sincere love, and we're called to enduring faith. May you be refreshed today. This is a beautiful setting. I praise and thank God I needed a break so bad. And this church and this organization allowed me to be a part of it, come down. I broke bread. We fellowshiped. If we took care of one another. We prayed for one another. It's good. It feels good. All right? Scan your QR code. May the strength of God sustain us, right? May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. And may the love of God go with us every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Loretta. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. So uh, I was mentioning at the beginning of this that uh, Dr. Greg Reed, who is a wonderful, um, he has a ministry called Youth Fire Ministries in El Paso, Texas, kind of on the front line of everything that's going on with the border and everything like that. But he's always had a passion for youth. Um, he was planning to travel here to join us in Melbourne, Florida. But um, as we talked about this morning and, pray, and prayed over, uh, his best friend uh, as, is actually in the process of going for surgery. I think he was telling me a quadruple bypass. So this is not, um, this is, this is not a minor thing, but it's a big thing. And, uh, but it's a small thing for God. So we already believe and pray uh, for good success and everything. It's the right doctors in the right place at the right time with the Holy Spirit uh, guiding them so that it will be successful. But he is going to join us on on a uh, the technology of Zoom. I don't know how we made all this stuff work. That was maybe one of the positive things that came out of uh, out of the COVID world was was uh, was that at least we learned how uh, to be able to use that technology so we can stay connected. I know in the uh, Chesapeake Bible College world, you know, Dr. Loretta's up in Boston. Dr. Ed is in. Greensboro, we're here in sunny Florida, <laughs> and, and but we can have a meeting every other week and, and kind of keep the college stuff moving. So uh, 
it looks like the world famous Dr. Greg Reed. Are you there? Can he hear us? Or can he just wait? I'm here. I can hear you very well. Wow. God bless you. I love the background. And so with Thank that, you. let me uh, let me get out of the way and we'll ask uh, Dr. Greg Reed. He's going to share on the topic. Let's go. Time for the gospel. Amen. Thank you very much, and I want to thank you all for your prayers for my friend. He's still in the process right now deciding when to do the surgery, but it's a very touch-and-go situation, and I ask for continued prayers for him and for his family. We've been friends for 50 years, went to Bible school together. That's the kind of friend you want to have for a lifetime friend. And, uh, may God grant that for every one of us, those people, the tribe, as they say, uh, to surround yourself with in the days that we're facing. Um, before I get started, I wish I could have been there. I really was looking forward to it and hoping uh, God willing to be there for the 70th anniversary, which will be on my 70th birthday, which is going to be pretty amazing just to even think about how the time has gone by. I, but I was going to bring these and I couldn't. So if uh, at some point, uh, you know, I could make my address available to everybody, maybe at some point, that'd be great. But this is a little project that I've been involved with for the last seven years. It's called Stranger to This Place, and it's a collection of songs and spoken word. Uh, God gave me a brilliant music producer to help put this together. I'm going to get do what all the, the big guys do. I'm going to give you the QR code to see if you want to be able to snap that. And uh, just hold that up for a minute and... Uh, take that, and, and it, this will take you right to the website, which will explain what the what the the songs are about and what the project is about. It's a 13 song collection. Um, if you want a personal copy of it, it's free. If you guys want to get my address and write to me, I'd be glad to get this to you. We're very happy about this. It's kind of like for such a time as this, uh, the songs are about a uh, brief. They're about. Uh, Proclaiming the gospel, uh, they're about an intimate relationship with Jesus, and it's 43 minutes of, of music. You can just go and spend time in the presence of God. So I hope you're able to avail yourself of that. So for the next little while, I want to talk about um, it's go time. The theme seems to be very strong, and it seems to be consistent with everything everybody has been saying. So I really want to share a message of encouragement with you all this morning uh, in the work that you're doing. I think all, all of us have faced some as Dr. Carey has said, it's, it's been a lot, lot of attacks. There's been a lot of opposition from the enemy. And why wouldn't there be? Because we're living in a world now that is oppositional to the gospel. That doesn't change what we should be doing. And I, I, I smiled when I heard Dr. Carey talk about, why is the world so mad at us? You know, we're, as Christians, we're kind of harmless. But we know that there's a war underneath that. And uh, Dr. Carey had asked me to mention just a quick word. I uh, wrote a book um, several years ago now called War of the Ages, a complete scriptural and spiritual guide to confronting and defeating Satan's kingdom. It's called War of the Ages, and it would be just great uh, if you wanted to write me for it. Or it's on Amazon because we need the tools because the real war is we go to preach the gospel. As Ephesians say, we do not fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and spiritual wickedness in high places. People are not our enemy. The enemy is our enemy, and we need to go after with the tools of, of what God has given us, the Word of God, the love of God, the power of God, to get in there and dismantle the enemy's plans. That's why there's so much anger, because people are responding to his anger towards believers. So we want to be able to steady on till dawn in what God gives us to do. So the uh, title of what I want to share with you is simply, It's Go Time. And of course, it's Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the, the reason we need to do this, folks, and it's becoming increasingly apparent, there is no hope outside of Jesus at all. There's no hope. There's no, the, the, Even the world's saying, particularly for the Middle East, there's no solution to this, and everybody knows it. And we know according to a prophetic calendar, yes, there will be somebody that's going to solve it just suddenly, and we know who that person's going to be. He's not going to be from God. But in the meantime, we need to hold steady until he comes and takes us. And we need to be able to do that realizing without Jesus, what does the world have to offer? Uh, and I mean, it's got nothing for this generation. They're not interested 
in any of the solutions the world has to give because none of it's working. This particular younger generation has been so damaged by what happened with COVID that they're still not recovering. There's a level of rage, uh, a, a, a desire to just go and to um, just make all the pain stop. And we need to be able to get into that. And we do. why do we do this? Because uh, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, the love of Christ compels us. And as I've said many times, like someone else said, let my heart be broken with the things that break the heart of God. And we need to look at this world as, as one of my young people. I've got a great Monday night Bible study at college and older uh, young people. And one of them used the phrase this way, said, don't engage the rage. And I think as believers, we're being pushed and pulled politically, uh, emotionally, socially, morally. We need to understand that don't engage the rage because the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. So we need to hold steady and we can need to let the love of God compel us to go into all the world. Let our hearts be broken and reach out to the least and the last and the lost. And we're called to go to the ends of the earth. One of my favorite stories and understandings was when Jesus took his disciples to Capernaum. And you have to realize they were right at a place where the disciples, which arguably were uh, high school to college age kids, you know, we think of them as, you know, old men at the table, like the Da Vinci, uh, you know, stroking their beers and say, what meaneth this? But they were really pretty close to being college age, most of them. Peter was probably the oldest. And um, he, Jesus took these young disciples, his Talmud, right down to where they could see uh, from a distance, probably the most ghastly uh, worship place of heathens that there was. Uh, which is where they worship the, the the goat god. They worship Pan, and on that there was a hole. There was a river that went through that they called the River Styx, and underneath there uh, was the uh, was Hades. That's what they called it. And Jesus took his disciples down there, and you know you know the scriptures. Peter said, "Who do you say that I am?" Peter said, "You are the you Christ, the Son of the Living God." And Jesus said, "Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you." Um, the, you are Peter the rocket, but on this rock, and I think he may have even been pointing to this huge mountain where they worshipped all these horrible things. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. And I think he was saying, take the gospel to the gates of hell. It's far past time that we stop being afraid of what the world's doing and send our, us into the places where nobody else is going to go. You know, there's been a lot of talk about human trafficking the last number of years and i'm so thankful because this is one area that i'm deeply deeply involved in and have been involved in uh rescuing and educating for the last probably 30 years and i thought just recently because forgive me when you realize what these children have been through in terms of human trafficking what they've been forced to endure the sexual abuse the physical abuse uh all sorts of things when they grow up how damaged they're going to be are we prepared to reach out to them and provide healing because you know what the only ones that can heal that kind of damage the only one heal that kind of damage is the lord jesus christ no one else can do it and we need to be ready to go to the gates of that kind of hell and compel them to come and bring them in and love them with the love of jesus into healing and that what time is it to do the gospel what time is it to go it's yesterday we in the church needs to wake up and get on the front lines right now because the scriptures say the night is far spent romans 13 1 uh, through 12 um, or 11 through 12 says do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed the night is far spent the day is at hand therefore let us cast off the works of darkness uh, and let us put on the armor of light see we carry the light you want to know why People are angry that we're Christians because they're in darkness. I think you might remember when you're growing up, you're trying to get a nice nap on a Saturday. Your mom or your dad comes in and says, get out of that bed. It's time to do chores. And they flip on the light. It's the last thing you want. It's like, get out of my room. That's kind of what the world does when we turn on the light of Jesus Christ. It's like, we don't want to see it. Well, we're compelled by the Spirit of God to put on that armor of light and move the gospel forward that way. When it says the night is far spent, it means like it's thinned out. It's running. We're running out of time to do this, folks. And we have to cast off every work of darkness 
Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So part of the job we have as believers, pastors, uh, educators, everything, we need to expose the lies. We do not compromise with the lies. The progressive church is taking over the Western church with all of this nonsense about the gospel, the, the, the scriptures not being the word of God and about Jesus not being the only way to God and all sorts of things that they're compromising on. We cannot afford to compromise. We've got to expose, as, as Paul said, speak the truth in love, but speak it. That's part of pushing the gospel forward. And we take this gospel to, we need to take it to the youth. We're losing this generation, folks. If they don't get a hold of Jesus, they're lost. And the same Jesus that saved me when I was part of the Jesus Revolution and that saved many of you is still the Jesus that saves today. And he's able to save and to heal and to, and to deliver. We need to have the confidence in God to go in there on the front lines and bring that gospel to the whole world. We need to bring it to the elderly. One of the things that grieves me, folks, and I've seen it's been a tool of the devil, I believe, to silently begin to separate youth from elderly, youth from elderly. The youth are put in a small situation where, uh, and, the, and the elderly are put in elderly groups where they're you know, asked to do nice things. Listen, God, if you're in that category as I'm getting to be, you are still vital to the kingdom of God. There are still, your prayers have potency in this hour. Your prayers have so much power to deliver the word of God to this generation and to this and, and to the powers of darkness and to make them stand down and demand that they do release this next generation. Folks, we need to be able to pass the torch. And it's a, it's a crime, I think, that we've allowed that separation. We need to pray that God would bring the generations together because the elderly need those in the younger generation that they can pass on what God has given them. And the younger need the legacy. Uh, they may or may not do it, but inside, I can tell you, they're crying for it. They're crying for direction. They want to know, does anybody know the roadmap? Well, you do, and I do. And we need to bring that to them. And folks, is anybody involved in youth the ministry? I'm going to tell you right now, you cannot raise a generation of Christian youth anymore the way that we've been doing with, you know, Xboxes and a few games and a few snacks and give them a little Jesus snack, five minute, you know, message at the end and expect that to get them to endure what's coming. They won't survive college. We need to give them armor training for the warfare that they're going to be facing. And it's, it's high time that we did that. So we need to bring the gospel to the broken, to those who are bound. We need to bring the gospel to the to the graveyards. And I may have shared this last year, but it was so revelatory to me when I was reading again the story of the man in the tombs that was running through the tombs, cutting himself naked, just totally demon-possessed. And when Jesus got off the boat, he made a beeline for this guy. And he went, and this is a guy, I'm sure his parents couldn't visit him because of the Jewish laws, because it was he was in a cemetery. He was totally possessed. Everybody was frightened of him. He must have felt like the most alone creature in the whole world, trapped and bound by these demonic creatures. And Jesus just went right to him. And of course, they cried out, you know, leave us alone. We know who you are. And Jesus made them leave. And when, when they came, the city people came up, the town people came up, it said that the man was sitting there clothed, and in his right mind. And I'm so deeply touched by that because we need to go to the graveyards of this world where people are losing their minds and they're they're totally out of control and they're demon possessed and demon controlled. And we need to go to the graveyards with the powerful name of Jesus Christ who can set them free from all of the darkness. That's our commission. That's what we are commanded to do. The scripture is very clear. We need to go after the lost sheep and we need to go after the lost coin in the house. You know, we're geared towards, in this culture, uh, the, the mega church model. And we need to kind of ask God to, to redefine that. It's not that it's wrong to have a big church. It's that we need to remember that the gospel goes to the prodigal, the one that's out there that's, that's just lost, the one in the house that's lost. And sometimes bigger isn't better. Sometimes we need to gear down on how do we... How do we take care of the people right next to us? Uh, and my favorite, one of my favorite stories in the New Testament is the Apostle Peter, who was speak, uh, pardon me, Philip was speaking to the big crowds. He got the big crowds. 
And the Lord spoke to him and said, told him to go down to a road where there, there was an Ethiopian eunuch who was the assistant, I think, to Queen Candace, and he's coming down the road. And, and, and the, the, the Ethiopian man was reading out of the book of Isaiah. And, and you know, Philip comes off, runs along the, the, the chariot. What are you reading? He says, well, I'm reading this, but I don't know what it means. And, and Philip explained the whole thing to him and what it meant and who Jesus was. And the man said, what's hindering me from being gospel, uh, being baptized? There's water right there. And so that man got baptized right there in the water. And then when he came up, of course, God had just pulled Philip somewhere else and translated him somewhere else, which is an astonishing story. But God asked him to leave the crowds to go after the one. Folks, we need to have the heart that's not looking for the biggest and the best. That's not what the kingdom is about. Let's look for the least and the last. Let's look for the one because on those things, the kingdom of God is built. It's such a powerful thing we need to get a hold of because there's so many people that just need to have somebody come to them and explain to them what this gospel is about. So how do we go forward this? First of all, we go forward fully armored. That's one of the reasons I wrote War of the Ages. I wanted to explain what the armor was, that we need the helmet of salvation to protect us from all the noise and all of the lies. We need the breastplate of righteousness to protect us against the fiery darts of the wickedness. We need the shield of faith to move forward. And we need to do it as an army. And that's, I love the concept of the Roman army here because they literally, when they went forth, they linked shields together so it looked like one massive shield coming towards the enemy. That's the way we need to be. We need to surround ourselves with people who will go to war with us and lock shields because this isn't, this isn't a war we can fight alone. We have to have that army that goes with us when we do. We need to be clothed in light. We need to go forward in humility full of the love of God, full of the truth of God. I think it was Mario Murillo says that the, that, that, that moment, that, that catac not cataclysmic, but that, that critical moment, critical mass is what he called it, where the love of God and the power of God and the word of God come together. There's no stopping the gospel when you can put those three things together. And I appreciated the word this morning because we have to take care of ourselves. We can't afford, cannot afford to do this battle unless we're in the word of God every single day morning every single day that's our bread that's our life that's our strength and we need to do that before anything else we need to go forward boldly we've got we need to be assured of the message uh that we're not ashamed of the gospel of christ because it's the power of god and the salvation to everyone that believes and we need to have that assurance of our message it needs to be uncompromised we need to be a full of compassion for the lost and hatred for the devil in all of his destructive ways. Folks, one of the things that I uh, reluctantly have had to be involved with is genuine, um, I call them demon extractions over the years. I think there's a lot of nonsense in what they call deliverance ministry, and we need to be very careful of who we support and, and what they teach in this regard. But I can tell you one thing, there hasn't been a single extraction that I've ever done where I didn't do it with tears streaming down my face because I had such a hatred for what the enemy had done for that person and such a deep compassion for the person that was so bound. So we need to have that kind of heart. So what are we doing? We're going forward and, and the scriptures say, as we go forth, it says preach saying the kingdom of God is at end. Kingdom of heaven is at end. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received freely give. So there's a few elements here that are really important. First of all, I believe in a healing God, and I thank you for your prayers. I believe in a healing God because he does heal and he does miracles. But it also says cleanse the lepers, which means, means we need to go to those who are socially unacceptable, to those who the world wouldn't want anything to do with and bring the power of Jesus to cleanse those who feel so unclean, who feel so rejected and so abandoned because of their sins. Raise the dead. I believe God raised the dead. I've certainly read stories where God has done that, and I believe it to be so. But we also need to raise the dead that are just in the world, that without Christ, they have no life. And so we need to bring them to life through the gospel. Cast out demons. Now, this is a tough one for people. Uh, part of my dilemma has been trying to educate pastors. That this particular thing is a command. It's not a suggestion. And I believe every believer, every pastor, every leader should be ready. And some have been honest enough to say, well, it scares me. Well, don't be scared. A little child that knows the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus can send 10,000 demons to flight. 
if you're a man of God, a woman of God, you don't have to be afraid. And the first time you wield the authority, not your authority, but the authority of Jesus Christ in a situation where deliverance is needed, and you watch the enemy stand down, then you'll know there's no reason to be afraid. You take that authority and you do what Jesus said. But he said, freely you have received and freely give. Folks, we live in a Western world where we went through so much excess uh, in the 1980s, and some of that still clings to us. I was very disheartened the other day to see someone that I had greatly respected at some point that is now charging, I don't know, exorbitant amounts of money to cast out demons, to cast out demons. And it's like, this is so wrong. Freely you've received, freely give. We need to give of the gospel in every way that we can. So this is the command that Jesus has given us. And in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You will go therefore making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded to you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we're to go and to preach the gospel, to tell the truth and to make disciples. Folks, there has never been a time where it's been more important that we make disciples. And I'm telling you that youth in this generation that come to Christ are just a, a, a harvest waiting to be reaped by the older generation. They need the teaching. They need the training. They're hungry for it. This is the most fatherless generation uh, probably in, in history. And it's a time for mothers and fathers and the Lord to start praying and saying, Lord, bring those to me that I can get in and start to disciple, that I can raise up. You know, it's just a matter of going and having a meal, sharing a cup of coffee, you know, inviting them over just to, just to care for them, pray for them. How can I pray for you? Uh, is there anything I can do? That's discipleship, and it need, it's a lost art, and we need to regain it. I'm here because I'm the product of fathers and mothers in the Lord that saw a young man that was lost, that came to Christ, that needed direction, that needed teaching that needed fathering and mothering, and that that became the, the backbone of who God made me to be and who has blessed me to be able to do that to, uh, by God's grace to several generations now. We need to bring the gospel in instant in season and out of season. Second Timothy 4, 2, preach the word, be instant in, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So we need to be ready is what it's saying, be ready to preach the gospel, be ready to talk about Jesus. Don't be afraid. If there's a conversation and subject of Jesus or God comes up or the word of God or any number of things, say, Lord, give me the boldness to get in this and, and tell the truth. And say, well, maybe they get mad at me. Yeah, probably, but you know what? And people are like, well, what, you know, what if they think I'm a hater? Listen, if you preach the gospel angrily or if you preach it with all the love in the world, people will still, some people will still hate the word. So do it in love. And if they hate you for it, then, you know, rejoice. Jesus said rejoice when that's what happens, because so they treated him and all the prophets before him. So this command to go into the world includes the invitation to come and see. John 1, 46, Nathaniel said to them, can any good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. So do events, do opportunities to reach the lost and say, come and see, invite people. I love it. You know, in El Paso, we have, my former church has a a Christmas outreach every year. And I love it because they pass out the thousands of flyers to the people in the church. They send them to everybody you can, invite everybody you can. So many people have gotten saved. But it's not just, you know, come to church, but come and see what we're about. Come to see, spend time with people and say, I want to, mo don't say this to me. You want to model who Jesus is to your friends and your family that way. Uh, John 1, 38 and 39, Jesus turned to the, the, the people who are following and said, uh, what do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. So we want to reach out to the world and say, come and see where Jesus is. Come and see where the power of God is. Come and see where the love of God is. Come and see where the answers are for all of your life's needs. So what keeps us, and I'm about to wrap up here, and I'm so glad I was able to share this time with you. What keeps us from going forth in this hour? One of the things is fear. We're aware, I mean, as you turn on the news, and we've been absolutely just shocked and nauseated by what we see coming out of the Middle East and the absolute sheer hatred for God's people and what's becoming a wave 
of hatred for God's people here in the United States. And we must, as, as the, someone has said, it's time for us to decide who we are and who we stand and who we stand with. But as I watched some of the images and heard some of the horror stories of what they did to little children and to, to mothers and to parents, it's easy to be fearful. I can see why the scriptures say, men's hearts shall fail them from fear. Do not be among those that are afraid. Fight the fear that you feel when you turn on the news, when you see what's happening around you. The righteous are bold as a lion, and we need to be fearless, fearless, fearless in this hour. It can't come from us, but he will give us that fearlessness because it has to come from him. I've had to tell God many times, God, this is scary, but give me boldness in the middle of the fear and break that fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. I will not be afraid in this hour of the gates of hell. God, give me the courage to do whatever it takes to push the gospel forward. And yes, the cost of discipleship is about to go up. Sign on the dotted line of this war anyway, because the Lord needs those that are not going to shrink back, but that are going to boldly proclaim the truth. Some of the things that keeps us from moving the battle forward, folks, honestly, is just sheer weariness. And I know if I ask to raise your hand, I can't see you, but I know you can see me. Raise your hand if you're feeling that weariness. Yes. We feel it. It's a war. Book of Daniel talks about the power of the Antichrist. It says he will make war against the saints and wear them out. And we're feeling it. We feel it at every step. We feel like it's like it's like those dreams where you're just slogging through the mud or you're trying to run and you're not going anywhere. We all feel that. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is my daily prayer for us, that we would be in that weariness, reaching out to God and saying, God, give me the strength I need for each day to go forward. And folks, and one of the things I love about Dr. John Douglas is one of the reasons, of many reasons, I understand, that he started AEA. And I was blessed because I was born the year AEA was born. And Dr. Douglas and Dr. March took me under their wing at the same time uh, around this world. I, I believe that the, uh, Charles and Judy Farmer were with them before me, but we were taken in around the same time. I was honored to get our, my doctorate at the, at the same AEA meeting as, as Dr. Farmer and uh, had fallen into sin. Some that had felt like God was through with them. And I loved these people because they understood that God was not through with them. And he knew that they would be rejected in almost every other organization there was. But they were about restoring those that had fallen and lifting them up and putting them back on the front lines of ministry. It's so rare and it's so wonderful. And I just want to talk to anybody that's listening who has had failure in your spiritual life on any number of, of places. And you know what? My favorite portion of Scripture, and probably in the book of Zechariah, talks about Joshua, the high priest, that stood there before the Lord, and he was his garments were filthy, standing there in the priest's garments. And I can't imagine the shame. I can imagine, and many of you can as well, the, the sense of failure. God, I failed you. And you know what? God jumps into the picture and says, I have chosen him, and I perpetually choose him. I perpetually and will forever choose them. And he calls for a new clean robe and a clean turban and proclaims to the devil because the devil stood up to oppose him and said, see, God, that's your chosen servant. Look how filthy he is. And God comes in and says, that's enough, Satan. I choose them and I perpetually choose them and gave them a new start and a new robe and a new, a new mission. Folks, don't ever feel like you're finished because of personal failure. Get up. If you fail, just as long as you fall, fall towards the cross and get cleansed and get up and get going. There's not a lot of perfect soldiers out there right now. And if you know enough about warfare, if you got a band of brothers on the front line, the one thing you need to know is you're going to fight and die for each other. You're going on the front lines together. You're not asking about your personal sins and failures. You're saying, are you ready to go? Are you ready to preach? Are you ready to fight? And then you move forward. So put down the shame. 
put down the sense of failure and get up and stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Take on that cloak of righteousness and don't let the devil put you under condemnation anymore. Now, lastly, I just want to share from Judges 6, 12 to 14. This is the story you all know about Gideon. And the angel Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty man of God, the Lord is with you. And of course, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? And where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? Now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Now, we need to be honest and say there's times we said, Lord, you know, I know you're with me, but help. You know, I need to see the power. I need to have the the infilling of your Holy Spirit like we did when we first knew you. Kind of like Gideon. We're feeling worn out. We're feeling like, you know, but there's all these things that are biting us and that are binding us and are trying to keep us from our true purpose. So like Gideon, we're feeling like you're talking to a mighty man of God. An angel comes and calls me a mighty man of God. Have you spent time with me? It doesn't matter because the Lord is the one who proclaims that we're mighty men and women of God, and we need to believe what he says and not what the enemy says and not what some of the people that know us say and not what we might tell ourselves. If God says I'm, mighty man, I'm a mighty man of God, then I'm going to stand in that might. And the interesting verse here, it says, The Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength that you have, and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. It's God who sends us. And he says, go with the strength that you have. You remember Moses when he was in the wilderness. I mean, when he the Lord appeared to him and he said, what is it that you have in your hand? And of course he said, I have a staff. I have a shepherd's staff. So that word is very powerful to me because God is saying to us, what's in your hand? We, you may feel weary. You may feel like you can't go any further but God's saying what's in your hand what are the tools that I've given you what are the things that I've given you so God's saying find out the tools that I've given you and do that with the strength that you have because God it's a given that it has to be God's strength but there's reason Gideon said go in this your strength because he was saying I need you to engage your strength in this and your commitment to go fight the battle before I can pour in my strength to give you everything you need to do the impossible in this battle. So my encouragement to you in this last minute or so is that you find out what's in your hand this year. Take some time. I want to encourage you to take a few days, get before the Lord, and say, Lord, what are the tools that you've given me? I've had some time to do that myself, and I've said, okay, the tools that God's given me, I, I'm a scribe, um, and, and I, 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 I have youth outreach. And there was a number of things I could place before the Lord and say, these are my tools. Now, Lord, I'm giving you my strength. Give me your strength to use those tools to go out in battle. So I just want to encourage you all uh, in this moment. Let me just pray with you real quick. Father, I pray for my friends that I cannot see, but I know that are there, that are listening online and also are there in Florida, where I so long to be this year. And may God, you please grace me that I might return again this next year. Lord, grant your strength, Lord, in the weariness. Pour out your power on your precious servants, God. I pray for those who have been wounded this year. Lord, I sense that there's several people that have had several major losses. One of them is a huge financial hit, God. I pray you pour out your abundance on them. Lord, there's been two or three people who have lost precious loved ones, Lord. Help them to work through the grief, Lord, that comes and goes so that they can continue to stand, Lord. Some have lost family members to the world. Lord, give them the strength and encouragement to, to battle on, Lord. The end of the story has not been written. And Lord, we're getting up to the last moment. of You're about to conclude things. You're about to come back, Jesus. Help my friends to be strengthened, to just lay down everything, Lord, to run the races before them, putting aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, running the race and looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is therefore set down at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Grant these graces to my precious friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for letting me be with you. God bless you.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Greg Reed. Uh, it's always a blessing to be able to sit at the feet of a great teacher, and uh, and that is certainly the case uh, with Dr. Greg Reed. So again, we'll be praying for uh, for the victory report that we believe is coming for your friend, and we will be Thank looking you. for you here uh, in Melbourne, Florida next year as we celebrate your birthday, but also the AA birthday. How about that? God bless you, sir. Thank you. Amen.